you have a, a problem in the way, in, in this we have to become conscious of, that you have, you have Lynn's generation, the World War II generation, which knew that the British Empire were their enemies. They knew it because they knew that the threat to America, because of what Roosevelt did, that the threat to America in the 1930s was fascism. Every country in the world was fascist in the 1930s and 20s. When the, when the economic crisis hit, and started first in the 20s, and Italy was the first place it went fascist with Mussolini, and many people said, well, you know, Mussolini, he's, he, that's the kind of government you need in a crisis. And then you had Hitler come to power in Germany. And then you had uh, fascists come to power in Japan. And you had Franco take power in Spain. And you had a move for a fascist government in Mexico with the Synarchists. The British government was pro-Hitler. The King of England had to abdicate because he was pro-Hitler. The, the leaders of the British government praised Hermann Göring and Herr Hitler as the model for bringing order and Mussolini. Winston Churchill praised Mussolini for bringing order and stability to their nations in a time of crisis. And uh, every country in the world went fascist, except the United States. And Roosevelt was under pressure to become fascist. The Wall Street bankers and the Boston bankers were pro-fascist. And they, they hated Roosevelt because he would not go along with their fascist schemes. And they tried to kill him when he, became, when he got elected before he took office. They tried to overthrow him when he went into office. They organized a thing called the Liberty League, which was a fascist movement, a pro-Hitler, pro-Mussolini movement in the United States, whose purpose was to try and establish fascism in this country. So Roosevelt was fighting fascists the whole time he was president, and he knew that there was going to be a war, ultimately come down to a military war against fascism. And these guys were still fascists, people like, like Prescott Bush, who paid money to Adolf Hitler to support the Nazi party, or Averill Harriman. These Wall Street bankers were giving money to Mussolini and Hitler and were hoping that they could have a pro-fascist government in the United States. And the only, they, they only stopped being pro-fascist pro after Pearl Harbor. And then they became anti-fascist until Roosevelt died. And then when Roosevelt died, they went back to being fascist again. And this is what Eisenhower called the military-industrial complex. They gained their influence under Truman. They gained, became more power. So right-wing fascist, pro-fascist elements. These are the guys who, 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 over the 50s and these are the over the <coughs> 60s and 70s and 80s, uh, dismantled all the Roosevelt programs, all the regulations, all the Roosevelt economic programs and put in place this system of globalization and free trade. These are the guys who Dick Cheney is run by. These are people like George Soros, who is a pro-Nazi. Uh, and um, these are the people who uh, were against. Now, the World War II generation understood that. But as Lynn's described, at the end, of when Roosevelt was alive, they were young people who their president rallied against fascism and they responded. And the whole country was involved in it. There were 10 million soldiers and everybody else was involved in it and they fought the war. They went all over the world and they fought the war and they came back from the war with the idea that we're never going to let this happen again. And then because Roosevelt was dead, the fascists started to take over and influence policy in the United States and almost all that generation became frightened and cowardly. They said, we're not going to get involved in politics. We, can't, we're not, we don't have a leader who will fight this. LaRouche was a unique guy because he and a small number of people said, we're not going to capitulate to this kind of stuff. But the children of the World War II generation, who were raised by parents who had become cowardly, my generation, became so fearful that we uh, were denied the Roosevelt policy in order not to offend the fascists. And so therefore, your generation doesn't even know that this is the fight. <laughs> <laughs> but the good thing is that we have this principle that Shelley talks about. 
Another sort of negative way to, to state the principle of Percy Shelley is that in a period of crisis, a lot of people realize that most of the things they think about are really stupid. Most of the things they really believe they believe really strongly are really just stupid ideas. And they learn lessons about how stupid they've been most of their life. <laughs> so that's sort of a negative way of selling, saying that on the one hand they become capable of, of uh, imparting profound conceptions concerning man and nature. On the other hand, they also are capable of uh, recognizing their own stupidity. And the, uh, in addition to this historical lesson that I've been describing, which is very important for people to understand uh, the strategy and the ins and outs of the history, I want to take up something which is on a, which LaRouche has emphasized, which is on a much more deeper level which is really gets at the heart of this, which is something that people are learning about even though they have no idea that this is what they're learning about. And there's only a few of us who really recognize that when you look at what I've described in just very brief outline of what happened in the 20th century, that there's, a, there's a, an aspect to this which if we understand it, will not only strengthen our current fight, but will lay the groundwork for, uh, for the hopeful and optimistic conditions that we intend to create over the coming decades. And that is a recognition of that the uh, second law of thermodynamics is not a universal law. Now, most people say, what the hell does that have to do with anything? The second law of thermodynamics. Most people don't even know what the second law of thermodynamics is. And yet, the idea that the second law of thermodynamics is a universal law is a deeply held belief by almost everybody you meet in the street today. Most people are walking around believing that the second law of thermodynamics is actually a universal law. And that the, um, that the, uh, universe actually, to put it crudely, uh, has a natural tendency to go from states of higher organization and existence to states of lower organization and existence. That is, the natural tendency of the universe is to prefer chaos and disorder and that anything man does is unnatural because we tend to push the universe away from states of disorder and chaos into states of higher order and organization. And so uh, people, it, and, and a, a shorthand way of saying this is that the, most people believe that the characteristic of the universe is to increase its entropy, the universe as a whole, to increase its entropy. Entropy is a term which is a measure of the level of disorder in a physical system. So we're talking about an increase in entropy, we're talking about an increase in the, um, an increase in the uh, level of disorder in the system. Now, a simple, and I'll get into more details on the physics of this in, in a little bit, but the, a simple example of this that, is, that comes out of is in the study of thermodynamic processes. That the, uh, that heat tends to flow from hotter bodies to colder bodies. If you put a, take a, take this, iron microphone stand here and stick it in the oven for, for a few minutes and then dunk it in some cold water, the hot iron will become cool, the heat from the iron will flow into the water, and the hot iron will become cool and the, and the water will become warmer. 
so the heat will go from the iron into the water. You won't ha take this hot piece of iron and stick it in the water and have the water get colder and the iron get hotter. Right? If you figure it's the same amount of heat, you got water at, say, you know, 50 degrees, and you got the iron at 500 degrees, and you put the iron in the water, then they get to a equilibrium state. They tend to converge, right? The iron gets hotter and the water gets warmer. You don't have the water freezing and the and the and the the heat from the water going into the iron and the iron going up to 200 uh, going up to 700 degrees, right? So you have a, a in a limited case that kind of thermodynamic process. There's a tendency of to, to go from a differentiated state where something is very hot and another thing is very cold and you put them together and they get into an equilibrium state. That's an increase in the entropy because it goes from a state of, of, of separation of order to very distinct thermodynamic states to a single state which is uh, equilibrium. I'll, I'll talk more about the physics of that in a second. And so when you look at the at the the physical universe, there's a false belief that the uh, th there's a false belief that in that this is a universal characteristic that the uh, that the general tendency of all things in the universe is to reach equilibrium states so that um, uh, that this is what the way human society is also organized. If you think about an application of the, of the idea of the second law of thermodynamics, that's what we're seeing in the collapse of the derivatives market because the whole philosophy behind the derivatives is that if you have a single loan, it carries a certain amount of risk. But if you get a whole bunch of people to agree to be part of that loan, everybody assumes a little bit of the risk of that loan, right? If I loan Paul $100,000, I'm risking $100,000 on Paul. It's all on me, right? And if he doesn't pay me back, I lose the money, right? But if I then take that $100,000 loan and get everybody in this room to participate in it, then we spread out the risk and I won't lose that much and you'll lose a little. If he, if he it flinches, we all lose a, a little bit and I can take a $10,000 hit and you can take a $10,000 hit, but I can't take a $100,000 hit, right? So we've, we've created more of an equilibrium state by spreading out the risk, right? But it's the same amount of risk. So. What, what the, the whole idea of the derivatives market is that if we create an equilibrium state by spreading out all this risk in the financial markets and the actual equations that the derivatives traders use to construct these financial instruments are the same equations that come out of thermodynamics, then we could create ultimately a globalized free trade system which could never collapse because it would always be in a state of equilibrium. So if one person went bankrupt here, then it would ripple through the system, but it would be a small ripple and the system would stabilize itself. And if another guy went bankrupt there, you would have ripples and then it would stabilize itself, right? They thought of the world financial system like a big thermodynamic system and that you create a maximum amount of disorder so that you have a whole bunch of independent things bouncing around and that if one thing started bouncing too fast the equilibrium of the system would tamp it down and according to the mathematics they use then this would According to the mathematics they use, the probability, they use probability says that this was the most probable state of things, and it was highly improbable according to their mathematics that Paul might 
uh, go bad on his loan, but not everybody would go bad on their loans at once. And so what happened is something that everybody said could never happen. If you look at the quotes from the guys at AIG's London-based uh, center where they did the credit default swaps, they said, according to our figures, there, we cannot conceive of a condition that is in, under which all the we could lose a penny on any of these investments. Okay. It'd be the equivalent of saying, when I put that 500 degree piece of iron in the water, the fact that the iron cools and the water warms and it reaches an equilibrium is the only, is the, the mathematics, which I'll describe, that that we use to understand that phenomenon, that physicists have used, are statistical methods. And those statistical methods say that that's the most likely thing that's going to happen. But it's still possible that something unlikely will happen. But it's so unlikely that we don't consider it a, a, re a realistic possibility. That's in this case. And, and that mathematics holds true in that case for reasons I'll explain. But when you're dealing with human beings and human behavior and the, and the development of the physical economy, something much, much different is happening. Because the actual universe, the one we really live in, is not a universe that is made up of things like iron and water, which are non-living processes. The actual universe we live in is a universe which has in it different principles, four really different principles. One is things like iron and water, non-living processes, which we call abiotic. These are distinctions which were known in, throughout history, but it, it, the, the one who put this on a rigorous basis was Vernadsky. Now these four principles, you have, you have the abiotic domain, non-living processes, then you have life, processes which are governed by life. And the, the, the life is a separate principle. A living organism is, has the same chemicals and material in it that a non-living organism has, except that it's being organized according to completely different laws because life is the governing principle. And there's a, separate, there's a difference between the material substance of the living organism and the living principle. And you know that because if you have a living organism and it dies, it's still the same material, but all of a sudden it starts to be organized in a different way. But, but living organisms interact with the non-living parts of the universe. You just take simple one-celled organisms and they ingest uh, material from the, from the environment around them. They metabolize that material and they utilize that material in the course of life, and then they expel other elements, like plants. They, the, the action of the sunlight in the chlorophyll allows the plant to absorb the uh, carbon dioxide from the air, break it down and form complex carbohydrates and sugars, and release oxygen in the process. And then animals breathe in the oxygen and metabolize the oxygen through hemoglobin, and the hemoglobin in the blood then metabolizes in the animal, and the animal expels the oxygen, expels carbon dioxide. So the oxygen atom, right, that's attached to the carbon atom in the air is the same oxygen atom, goes into the plant, comes out unattached from the carbon, goes into us, and comes out attached to a carbon. And the carbon it's attached to is the one that we ate, we got from the plant by eating the plant, right? So the carbon and oxygen atoms are in the air, non-living, they're in the plant, living, they're in the air, non-living, they're in our bodies, in animal bodies, living, they're out in the air again, right? So you have this same material is going in and out of living and non-living processes in a collaborative way, right? So the way these, this material behaves when it's in the air 
moving around randomly, and when it's in a living process, there are two different ways. It's the same material, but there are two different principles which are governing the, the organization of, these, of this thing. Now, the difference between the important distinction one has to make is not only are these two distinct processes, but they, which interact, but life is a is a, is a self-contained process. It does not come from non-life. You did not have any time in the history of the universe in which you had only non-living things. You may not have had living organisms, but the principle of life had to be there in order to organize the non-living parts of the universe into living organisms. Because you could take all the material and still not have life. And we could talk more about that specific to that as we go along. So you get that. And that right there already contradicts this, the, the, the characteristic that we see with this second law of thermodynamics. Because instead of the, uh, the uh, tendency, as with the iron into the water, the hot iron in the water, to go from higher states to lower states, the tendency of life is to organize things in the opposite direction, to take very small amounts of material to reorganize them into more complex structures, right? We take, the plant takes in the carbon dioxide and the sunlight and this molecule of chlorophyll enables the plant to take that carbon and oxygen and form it into a more complex sugar and another type of molecule, another type of or substance, right? So a living process actually has a characteristic that it decreases, its process decreases the entropy. It increases the order, which is a decrease in the entropy. Now, then you have another process, another principle, which is above living, which is the, uh, the cognitive process, which is only exists in human beings, which is a principle of the ability of the mind to recognize these kinds of principles that we're talking about, these kinds of scientific principles, and principles about the nature of man, so that we can organize our lives so that we not only man's action, not only is we have a biological function, a living function, just like any other animal where we biologically take in material from the abiotic domain and form it into more complex structures and so forth. But then that biological process serves a higher principle which no other animal has, which is the, the cognitive capacity, the creative powers of man. And those creative powers of man enable us to organize the living and non-living parts of the universe into higher states of organization and existence. We organize rivers. We change the course of rivers. We change the the we we change deserts into into agriculture land. We can transform the the whole living and non living parts of the world. We can we can change ourselves. We can increase our life expectancy from from thirty years to, to eighty years and beyond. We can alter our own biology. We can alter our, our own existence. And that's a power, that's a higher power, which doesn't derive from our existence as living creatures. It derives from our existence as human beings. So this principle of cognition has, is a higher principle than life, and it only works on one form of life, which is human life. But then you have still a higher principle which is above an individual human life. And that's the ability of an individual human being to interact creatively, the creative powers of an individual human being, to interact creatively with other human beings, both among our contemporaries, as well as past and future generations. And that level of collaboration enables us to 
create a higher form of organization of human creative life. For example, the way that an idea, a scientific discovery, say Archytas's uh, discovery of the development of the doubling the cube, is a scientific discovery that was made 2,500 years ago. And yet, this scientific discovery, uh, as Paul can show you, uh, is a discovery which is now part of human uh, culture and human intellectual development uh, in a way that, you know, e even over the, uh, the span of 2,500 years. So, if you think about the uh, fact that our generation, by reliving the great discoveries of science and art that have been made over the thousands of years of human history that we have access to, as in the people of our generation, as individuals, can incorporate into our knowledge, into our creative powers, the results of the creative efforts of thousands of people over thousands of years into a single individual lifetime, which lasts at best 80, 90, 100 years. So that's a higher principle, which is the social historical organization of human creativity. Right? Now, The, so that's, the, that's what LaRouche calls sometimes the fourth domain, the fourth phase space. The space, fa phase space of human social cultural interaction, which you could call actually the domain of the physical economy. So when we look at the real universe we live in, it's a uni the fourth domain. It's the domain of physical economy, which is this social historical interaction of ideas. So you have the individual creative idea but the creativity of the individual participates in this historical social collaboration of creativity within and among and across generations, which enables the, the, power, the creative powers of the individual to be increased and to increase the overall, it's increased by the collaborative effort of human creativity over generations, and it adds to that, right? So this human creativity is, what is human creativity? It's the discovery of something new. It's the bringing into the mind of a new idea which didn't exist there before. It's, you know, the example I always give, which is the easiest reference, is, you know, a simple problem like doubling the cube, which is why it's the subject of Plato's Meno, Meno dialogue, because it he uses it to show that this is a uniquely human characteristic, that even an uneducated slave has this ca capacity. And when you double the cube, I mean, to double the square. And when you double the square, you know, you set up the problem, and everybody always makes exactly the same mistake that the slave boy makes. <laughs> First, they double the side, and they get a square that's four times as big. Then they cut that in half, and they have the right size, but the wrong shape. And that's the next step is for them to figure out what to do, right? And there's, not, there's no more information you can give them. But then they make the discovery. Where does it come from? Plato calls it remembering. It comes from within their own mind. So something new arises in the mind which wasn't there. It's an anti-entropic process. The mind is decreasing its entropy because it's gone from a lower state of organization, which is expressed by the emotional turmoil which people are in, before they solve the problem. And their mind feels like it's all whirling around and they can't get their thoughts under control and they're completely enraged and so forth. And then you get the discovery and all of a sudden your mind is in a new state of organization and existence. And you recognize not only the solution to the problem, but you recognize something about the mind. You recognize a characteristic of the human mind, of your own mind, a power of your own mind. And that's a recognition of a, that's a, that right there is an intellectual process which is 
characterized by a decrease in entropy. It's exactly the opposite of this process of the iron into the coal water. And that process itself is susceptible to higher states of organization and existence by the way it participates in the development of the creative capability of all human beings across generations. So when you actually look at the real world we live in, you see that it's not characterized by a, a simple application of the second law of thermodynamics. The actual tendency of the universe we live in is a state of higher organization to go to higher organizations of existence. Now, as scientists, as, as Kepler, great scientists, the Greeks, Kepler, Leibniz, especially Kepler, indicates that when you now go back and look at the physical universe, abiotic processes, such as the motions of the planets around the sun, you find that the abiotic world itself, which at least in limited cases appears to increase entropy, is actually the general tendency of the abiotic world is to go for higher states of organization and existence, is to, go, is to be anti-entropic. And you see this with, say, Kepler, as Kepler points out, with the development of the solar system itself. If we look at, out at the night sky, you see the motions of the planets. As he points out, he says, you know, this, if these, he doesn't use the term entropy because these were, this was a, a term which was invented later in order to contradict what Kepler was doing. But what Kepler's argument is that the world of Ptolemy, Copernicus, and Tycho Brahe said basically that the planets move around the sun in patterns which from the standpoint of human beings might as well be arbitrary. They could be anywhere, they are where they are for reasons we could never know. And what Kepler shows is well the, the, the orbits that the planets actually move in are not circular orbits but they're elliptical orbits. These orbits are everywhere changing. And the, the orbits are everywhere changing. And they're changing according to harmonic proportions, which conform to the harmonic proportions of human creative reason, the five regular solids and the musical harmonies. And he says, it's as if nature were imitating art. So the, it, it, he makes the argument that the organization of the solar system itself and the abiotic world conforms to the principle which, under the guidance of human creativity and life, is what we would today call anti-entropic. Because the solar system these harmonics of the solar system are such that those that that solar system will support a planet Earth exactly where it is with the composition that it has, which is capable of sustaining life and capable of sustaining human life and being organized in such a way that human life on planet Earth can look into the solar system and into the galaxies beyond and discover the principles of organization of these processes beyond our capability. So, um, so from the standpoint of Kepler, and from the standpoint of Kepler's followers, Leibniz and later Riemann, uh, the actual uh, characteristic of the solar system is as we describe it today, as LaRouche describes it, a, a, a universe whose characteristic is towards higher states of organization and existence. Or another way to say that is the principle of human creativity, the principle that is reflected by human creativity, or human creativity reflects a characteristic of the universe itself. So this is the way, this, this concept that this is the basis on which the actual world is organized 
has been the argument that mankind has been having for the last several hundred thousand years over how to organize our society. Because human creativity has to be organized socially in order to get, get greater power. And so the social organization of society is the argument, the discussion, the struggle of mankind is how do we organize our society according to the principles of the creative powers of the mind. And the contrary argument by the part of the empire systems is that these creative powers of the mind are not universal and are only impose themselves on the universe and it's just an illusion by man that his creative powers have some efficiency in the universe itself. Because, and, and here's, the, here's the struggle that our side has always had, that Plato takes up in the form of the Republic, which is that the creative powers of the human mind are voluntary. You can't make somebody be creative. So how do you organize a society around the creative powers of the human mind when you don't know if people are going to be creative or not. And this is a question we'll, we'll put off uh, for later on to, to actually get into, but I'll throw it out there as the question. Because it'll become, it'll be easier to solve when we look at it in the, in the longer, in the, after, after we go through a few more steps. Bruce, yeah. Absolutely. Because it, it, otherwise, it'd be arbitrary. You, you set it's up not arbitrary. A nation or an institution right. to succeed. And then it fails for no, no, it fails for a reason. Well, of course. <laughs> <laughs> well, you can know what those, can't you know what those reasons are? Yes, you are? can. And that's the issue which we'll discuss because the question is that Plato hints how to do it, but he doesn't quite solve it. And it only gets solved later by the work of Cusa, in particular, which makes the creed break. Augustine and Philo and others begin to get in the direction, but Cousin makes the key breakthrough, and that's where you get the Renaissance. But, but, but this will be easier to understand if we look at this. Let's let's look at that question from from a from a, a the, the standpoint of the of the crisis we're in today. Okay. Now, the other thing that Kepler realized, and that the Greeks realized, that this issue raises that I was just talking about, that we want to get to, is that there's a direct relationship then between the way people think the universe works and the way they organize their society. Right? If you just look at this, for example, in the what Kepler was fighting, which also Plato and others were fighting, the difference between, say, the Aristotelian and the Socratic idea of man. What is the Aristotelian idea? That, that what I described about the human mind is a description that what is essentially uh, the essential characteristic of human being, this creative power, is characterized by a ability to change, right? When you discover the principle of how to double the square, you're not just discovering how to double the square, you're discovering how to change the way you think about how the world works. You've changed from thinking that all lines are the same to realizing that some lines are different than other lines. Some lines have a power to double the square and other lines don't have a power to double the square. Okay? But the, the characteristic of the human mind is that man changes. And that's the characteristic of an anti-entropic universe. That you're always going towards changes. There's no equilibrium state that things settle down to. So the characteristic to that change is actually is a reflection of the natural tendency of the universe to become more perfect. Now, the Aristotelian idea is exactly the opposite. That all this changing stuff that man does is, is a reflection of the fact that man is imperfect. Because the perfect is so perfect it doesn't have to change, right? That's Aristotle's idea. 
you hit in theological terms, they say God is perfect. Therefore, he doesn't have to change anything. And if God is perfect and doesn't have to change, then there's one thing he can't do, which is change. Okay, I say if God is so perfect that he doesn't change, then there's one thing he can't do, which is change. Because if he changes, then, then he would have had to admit that he was not perfect when he was perfect. So he can't be perfect. If he's perfect because he doesn't change, then he's not perfect because there's one thing he can't do, which is change. If he can change, then he's not perfect because he can always get better. So this is the paradox that, that Aristotle plays on. By, by making the illusion that perfection is a fixed state as opposed to a state of self-perfectibility. Perfection is the ability to get better. It's never, it never ends. This is a, what Einstein later calls a universe which is finite, self-bounded, but capable of unlimited potential. But we'll talk more about that when we get to it but the the uh, but then you take the that's the cosmology that Aristotle and the empire system imposed as their theology and view of the world you look at the earth you look at the solar system you look at the planets you go out in the night sky and you see everything is moving around the earth right and the farther away you get from the earth the less things move the planets move not only around the Earth, but they also do this retrograde motion and they speed up and slow down. The fixed stars move around the Earth, but they don't change relative to each other. So you see there's less change. So the Aristotelian theology is that the Earth, the, the heaven, is what's beyond the fixed stars, in which no change at all is occurring. Right? It's a big sphere. And God is out there, where no change occurs. Now, the farthest thing from the cent from the sur from the surface of a sphere is the center, right? So, as you get further, you get you get closer to the center, things start changing more. You get you get the fixed stars, then you get the planets, which change more, and then you get the Earth, in which everything is changing. Things are born and they die. Nothing on the earth is in the same state. Everything is in a state of change on the earth. And the, the things that change the most are living things. And the, the living things that change the most are human beings. And so therefore, since the human beings change the most and are the farthest from God, the farthest from the circumference, therefore we're the farthest, we're the least perfect thing. Totally, yeah, but this is, a, this is the way people thought about the, think about the world. This is the way the oligarchy and the empire system. And that the only time that man becomes more perfect, be, actually gets to perfection, is when you die. Because then you stop changing. Right? And you see, that's the, that's the theology of slavery. People who live in a, in a society that, who think that that's the way the world works that change is bad and no change is good are a society when they say they, and th th this is the way the empire system works God is up there you're here this is far from God so while you're here the emperor the duke the king know your place because God's not going to mess with this changing business when you die then that's when you get to see God if you're good while you're here so obey your P's and Q's Eat your spinach and work hard. <laughs> <laughs> don't complain about your, don't complain about the chains on your on your on your legs, right? So this is the so the, and and this recognition that the way people think about the universe reflects the way they organize their society and vice versa is. Key is has been recognized by as the the key issue in human development historically the 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 one the oldest uh, development of this is the is the uh, Homeric epics right 
Because what's the whole issue? Lynn keeps making about the Homeric epics, right? Here you have, you know, these warring city-states of Greece which kill each other in brutal war for 10 years over a picture of a woman. <laughs> right? Why? Because the gods who live up there on Olympus are the ones who control the world, right? They have the, the god of the sea, the god of the sun, the god of the moon, the god of this, and the god of that, and they all fight each other, and man is a plaything of the gods, right? The other recognition of it is the Delian problem, right? Where Archytas, the, the story of the Delian problem, where the, the, the people of Delos are having the plague, and they're told to double the cube, and they go to Plato, and he says the issue is not the doubling the cube, it's because the fact that you don't know how to do this, you haven't thought about this, is why you've got this economic problem. Because you haven't been thinking, you haven't been using your creative powers of the mind. Kepler's discussion of this with Ptolemy, Copernicus, and Tycho Brahe, where he refers back to the Dalian problem. He says this is what's bringing about the horrific wars that are just religious wars that are destroying Europe is a result of people's belief in this false idea of Ptolemy, Copernicus, Tycho Brahe, that man cannot actually know how the universe works. And Kepler puts astronomy on a different footing. And then after Kepler, you have the oligarchical reaction by introducing Newton. So under Newton now, Kepler's idea of the organization of the planets in the solar system as being a principle of, of relative motion organized around the harmonic characteristics which are congruent with the um, nature of the human mind is replaced by a universe in which anything could happen as long as you have objects it's a universe of empty space in which ob with absolute time in which objects move around in absolute space and absolute time attracted to each other by a mysterious force that acts at a distance instantaneously to attract all bodies in the universe. And therefore, you could have any solar system. The reason why we have this one is totally arbitrary. Mm -hmm. That's a Newtonian idea, mm -hmm. right? And Leibniz points out that that's absurd, right? But then they introduce that against Leibniz because they're, 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 as an attack on Kepler by the oligarchy trying to reestablish its control over the minds of human beings by convincing them that the actual physical universe, the organization of the universe itself, justifies the organization of society according to the empire system. And Kepler and Newton's laws don't gain much credence during the 18th century. They gain some. But then Gauss comes along with his discovery of the orbit of Ceres and proves Kepler's right, and Newton was wrong. And then you have the development of, of, of Gauss and Riemann, which I'm not going to go into too much detail about. We can discuss it in the question period. But um, what is happening during that period? What's happening during that period is there's a fight going on over the question of how do we organize society. And, the, and the, that is the fight that I began with, the fight of the American system versus the empire system. And the American system says, we have a nation, a society, which is organized around the principle of self-perfectibility. What does our Declaration of Independence say? It says, we hold these truths to be self-evident. At the time that it was written, this was not held to be self-evident, <laughs> that all men are created equal and endowed with the rights to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, which is a, uh, which, and happiness was Leibniz's, as you know, was Leibniz's term for the uh, creative powers, the recognition of the creative powers of the mind. So our Declaration of Independence, our Constitution, which his purpose is to promote the general welfare and to secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and our posterity. The future generations, long after we're gone. And our system of government is designed to promote change. It's designed to organize society according to the principles of the creative powers of the mind. 
And this, as John Quincy Adams spoke in his famous lecture in Ohio when he dedicated the observatory in Cincinnati, as Lincoln testified to, that this reflected, this form of government reflected the way the universe actually worked. It reflected the, the, the actual organization of the universe. It was the natural way for man to live because the universe itself bent towards creativity. Whereas the British kept trying to introduce in the empire system a science which would justify the acceptance of the empire system. And so in the mid-19th century, you had this uh, uh, study. You had, you had a study which I will just, there's a lot to talk about in it, but I'll just reference it, which comes up somewhat around this question of thermodynamics, which is interesting because it comes up from the standpoint of man's increasing power over in and over nature in the form of development of machines, which begins with Leibniz, the development of heat-powered machines. And, and so you have a study of thermodynamics from the standpoint of how does man actually harness uh, power to reach for higher states of organization of existence. And we start to see the development in industry of heat-powered machines, as opposed to machines prior to that, which were primarily mechanically powered machines, usually a water wheel that was using the mechanical power or the force of the water, or, or animal power, right? And this was, these were, you know, uh, like this, uh, even the mills, the steel mills, the Saugus Iron Works and these various uh, things, where you would have animal power, running a mill, or some type of mechanical power. And then in the 19th century, in the late 18th, beginning of the 19th century, after Leibniz and Pepin developed the steam engine, you begin to have the use of heat power to operate machinery. And so this begins to, th so this question of thermodynamics is intimately tied up with the development, the scientific development of how, what, what you're looking at with man harnessing heat is you're really talking about how man uh, harnesses power to increasing human power to transform the universe into higher states of organization and existence. And in the course of this work, uh, the grandson of Lazare Carnot, who was one of Leibniz's collaborators, or was a follower of Leibniz, his son, grandson, Sadi Carnot, did a study of this question of heat power machine and the heat cycle from the standpoint of how do you increase the harnessing of, of heat power to, to in machinery. So this became an inch, a big study and it's related to also Leibniz's discovery um, in his specimen Dynamicum, where he talks about the, uh, the principle of dynamics as opposed to mechanics and the inability to have a perpetual motion machine. So Sadi Carnot is talking about why you can't, how do you increase the efficiency? You can't have a heat powered machine which has greater than 100% efficiency. You always have less than 100% efficiency, a heat powered machine some of your power is going to be lost to friction and to mechanical processes and so forth. You can't have a heat-powered machine which produces more work than the heat has it capable of producing, right? So that's the, that's the engineering, the real issue of thermodynamics. Out of that, you get a whole discussion, okay, well, how does heat actually work? What is heat? And this is an interesting thing. When you talk about heating up that iron or heating up this water, what are you doing? Is heat an, a substance? Are you, are you putting something into the, into the iron? Is there some, well, this was the original idea at the time, the, the, the caloric theory of heat. That's where the word calorie comes from. There was some substance called called caloric fluid, 
which was like a fluid that was very thin that flowed in and out of bodies and when things got hot it was because they had more of this fluid in them yeah. and when things got cold the fluid flowed out of them yeah. well it's not a totally crazy theory because where, what are you talking about with, with heat people today have another theory which is equally crazy which is that you know you got rapid oscillations of particles and things you can't prove that either right so the question is what are you talking about with heat what does it mean? And out of this, you had you had you had some really stupid things that were that were introduced, ideas that were introduced. Leibniz, I mean, Riemann did a, did a lot of studies of this question of heat, Fourier, and others, because what you're really looking at when you're talking about heat is you're talking about something that is like with electricity and magnetism and gravity. You're talking about the interaction between things which you call material and things which you call immaterial. And Gauss talks about this, for example, with a magnet. When you have a magnet, an iron bar, and it's magnetized, the magnetic effect is immaterial. Right? You can take an iron bar and it's not magnetized. And it won't attract iron to it. But you magnetize it, and now it has a power to attract things, right? It has a magnetic power. But if you weigh the magnet and the iron, there's no increase in the weight between a magnet and an iron, an iron bar when it's magnetized and not magnetized. So you have a material object, but it has an uh, immaterial effect. Gravity is a similar thing. You have material bodies, and they exert an immaterial effect, gravity. And the point that Gauss makes is that the magnetism is immaterial, but you don't have magnetism except in the place of a magnet. And this, the same thing with electric, electricity. And later, Ampere shows the relationship between electricity and magnetism. Franklin was working on this subject. And then you have the uh, discussion of gravity. So this, this, this question of the material and the immaterial is another aspect of this whole discussion. <clears throat> and when you're looking at heat and magnetism and electricity and light, you're looking at the interaction of material and immaterial substances. And this too reflects something about the nature of man. Because as we were talking about with life, life is immaterial but it organizes material substances. Ideas are immaterial, but they have a power to organize life and non-life. But where do you find ideas except in human beings? They're immaterial, but you won't find ideas out in the air. Ideas are always inside human beings' head. You've got to have a living, breathing human being to have ideas. And even people after they die, the ideas they had live through other human beings. And they live through other human beings by those human beings associating those ideas with the human being who died. You don't think of Plato's ideas or Socrates' ideas without thinking of Socrates as a human being. Even when you don't know the person who created the ideas, you make up a person. You, have a, you associate that idea with a personality. And this is what Keats is dealing with with his Ode on a Grecian Urn. I often use that as the reference. It's very useful, right? Because in Keats's poem, he has this urn. It has all these people on it. And he asks them all these questions. Who are these people? What did they know? Where did they live? What kind of town was this? What were they praying to? Did this guy ever get a chance to kiss the girl? Did these leaves ever fall off the trees? You know, all these questions you can't answer, right? <laughs> But you associate, you know, what he says, what you know is that these people lived and died. And that this ideas that are portrayed in this urn are, uh, were important to them. And as he says, what, what you know is that when old age shall this generation waste, that these ideas are to us are important to us too. And we're going to be just like these people, dead and gone. 
But this urn will remain. This idea will remain. And it, what will it say? It will say, beauty is truth and truth is beauty. And that is all you know on earth and all you need to know. Right? So this is what... Uh, that you don't you you ideas again are immaterial. The material aspect of man is our finite lives. But what distinguishes man from all other creatures is that we recognize that there's a part of us which lives beyond our material existence. And it's that which lives beyond us from material exist beyond our material existence, our immaterial existence, our immortal existence, which is what really has to govern our lives. And that is how, to get, refer back to what we were discussing earlier, is how you actually organize society to inspire people to activate the creative voluntary powers of the human mind through this recognition of the superiority or the primacy of the immortal, immaterial thoughts. But this is reflected in the physical universe itself. That the material parts of the universe look to uh, look at us. The material parts of the universe look at us, or activate with our senses. But they're governed by things which we can see the effect of, but are immaterial, like magnetism or electricity and so forth. So when you're looking at heat, you're looking at this question of. Uh, Magnetism. I mean, you're looking at the question of the interaction of a material and an immaterial substance. So this forms a big subject of scientific discussion at the end of the 19th century. And um, and it uh, leads to a a very um, uh, it, it 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 leads to the controversy which. Uh, erupts at the end of the 19th century, beginning of the 20th century, which we're seeing the effects of now, uh, of, which has sort of governed the controversy over the whole last hundred years. Um, and this is the uh, question of where this, what I opened up with about the second law of thermodynamics, this is where this comes in. Because uh, you had, on the one hand, a uh, tendency to try and look at this question of heat, thermodynamics, from the standpoint of uh, this Aristotelian reductionist idea. And this is where the introduction of the idea of the universality of the second law of thermodynamics comes. So you know, think about this, right? You're talking about man using heat to transform the physical universe into higher states of organization of existence. And then you get people like Clausius and Grossman and Boltzmann and these others to come along. And they look at the nature of heat and they say, well, the tendency, the thermodynamic process is always to go from states of higher organization to lower organization. So man uses heat to increase the organization of the universe. But when you look at the abiotic characteristic of heat, it tends to flow the other way. Right? So Clausius introduces an idea that he says that the tendency in the universe is for entropy to be increased. So if that's the case, then all man does to increase the organization of nature and our society is, is unnatural, right? Well, this was the political argument which was going on in the second half of the 19th century. Lincoln defeated the British in the Civil War. But he didn't just defeat the British in the Civil War. We came out of the Civil War as a powerful industrial nation. Lincoln implemented the land-grant colleges. Lincoln built the Transcontinental Railroad. We increased the amount of steel and manufacturing and production, even during the Civil War. And at Lincoln's in, intention for the reconstruction of the South, as expressed in his second inaugural address, showed that had that continued, America 
you know, we, we, this would have gone even further. And in the post-Civil War period, the success of Lincoln's defeat of the Confederacy and the development of American industrial power became the model for Europe. Bismarck then began to unify Germany against the British and the Habsburgs around the idea of German industrial development. He defeated France in the Franco-Prussian War with the intention of then turning France into Germany's ally, which is why there was a big fight where, where uh, the, the Kaiser, who was a nephew of Queen Victoria, wanted to bomb Paris during the Franco-Prussian War, and Bismarck said, don't do it, because we've now defeated them militarily, we want to now make them our friend. And by bombing Paris, they prolonged the war and made the French their enemies, which continued to fester until World War broke out ultimately again in World War I. Mendeleev, the founder of the periodic table of the elements, came in and uh, wanted to establish the Trans-Siberian Railroad modeled on Lincoln. So Bismarck, the Russians, the Japanese around the Meiji Restoration, the Americans were all organizing to develop the continents using this increasing power of man over nature. And the introduction into science of this idea of the second law of thermodynamics was related to the attempt to stop that, to say, no, that's not the natural condition of man. The natural condition of man is to simply extract raw materials and cheap labor and to maintain a state of equilibrium. And what's a state of e social equilibrium? The British Empire. The sun never sets on the British Empire. It's always the same. It doesn't change. The best world is the world that doesn't change, the world that changes the least. If you have sovereign nations which develop their economies, the world uh, those nations change. We need to have an empire which doesn't change. So this is the direction of the British Empire. This was the political fight which was going on in the latter part of the 19th century when this whole issue was coming up. Now, at the same time, science was progressing because of this drive. And you had a whole series of experimental uh, work that was coming out, which uh, was focused on this question of the interaction of the material and the immaterial, and looking at whole parts of nature from the standpoint of discovering the kind of harmonic relations which Kepler had shown exist in the solar system. The problem, and I'm going to go through some of these things in just in, in somewhat uh, just pedagogical form, but it's something that you probably want to study in more detail because these are a lot of things which you today take for granted but uh, really don't know anything about. Like for example, you take the periodic table of elements, right? Everybody saw the periodic table of elements in your middle school chemistry class, right? And the teacher stands up there and blathers, you have this periodic table and talks about these elements and they have electrons and protons and neutrons and atomic weight and so forth. It's as if the teacher knows what the hell they're talking about, right? <laughs> the point is that these are very interesting subjects, but you have to go back and look at the original. Do you ever ask yourself, well, why, how did the first guy, what was the original discovery about? What were they actually doing? What was the experiment? Like people talk about electrons. Has anybody ever seen an electron? When we talk about an electron, we're referring to a concept that arises out of a paradox with an experimental apparatus, in which you take a, uh, a, a, a chamber, a glass ball, with some water vapor in it, and you send an electric current through the water vapor, and if you look carefully, you'll see some, some tracks, which uh, can be explained by imagining that those tracks are caused by something like a dust particle 
but that's very small, that uh, condenses the vapor in the air. Uh, and and if you and if you um, and because that uh, spark goes across an electric electrical potential, you say it's negatively charged because the spark is going from a negative to a positive charge. So these are just experiments, right? So what you have with the periodic table is first you have Mendeleev looking at the difference between the relationship between the way various materials interact with each other, which is sodium and chlorine and different different materials, the way they interact with each other, and how that inter the way they interact with each other is organized according to certain characteristics about the way they interact with gravity. That's called atomic weight. So you're talking about the interaction of a material substance with an immaterial effect, gravity, and then how material substances interact. Later on, other things come in, the interaction of these things with electromagnetic potentials, such as in spectroscopy and so forth. So you start to get all this body of physical evidence which comes up, which indicates that the universe in the very small is organized like Kepler talked about the, that the uh, planets are organized. Now, um, the, uh, the other aspect of this question of the material, the relationship of the material and the immaterial, which is very crucial, which Riemann talked about in his habilitation paper, is that the immaterial substances appear to be continuous. They appear to flow continuously in space. Like if you have a magnet and you, you have a, a piece of iron that is attracted to the magnet, there's no, the, 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 the attraction gets weaker and weaker as you get further away, but it's continuously weaker and weaker. It's, all, it's always there. There's no place where it's not there. But the magnet itself is dis discrete. It has a boundary to it. It has an inside and an outside. You don't have, the magnet has, a, has, a bound, has an end. There's a place where the magnet ends and the, and the magnetism starts. The magnetism appears to be continuous and the material body is discontinuous. And Riemann talks about this as being a very important aspect for, for us to try and figure out from the standpoint of science is the interaction between material and immaterial, I mean between continuous and discrete processes. The same thing is true with respect to life and non-life because whereas non-living processes don't have necessarily definite boundaries, all living processes are discrete. All living organisms have a some type of skin or a boundary or something which indicates where they begin and where they end, right? So, but the but the principle of life is a continuous process. Or another example is what we were talking about with the relationship of mankind, individual man to other human beings, that mankind is individual human beings, but there's a continuous process of human beings of the principle of creativity acting in our terms of our culture that is beyond the discrete beginning and end of an individual human life. Mm. The continuous process of the development of humanity is occurs through discrete individual human beings whose lives begin and end at definite points, but whose participation in the development of mankind as a whole is a participation in a process which is continuous. So this relationship between discreteness and continuity is a very important thing which I want to now focus on. Now there's a whole lot of scientific experiments which you can discuss which will elaborate 
the point I want to make right now. But the one that was probably the most important, the most dramatic in terms of creating the revolution were a discovery that was made by Planck and Einstein. Planck in 1900 and Einstein in 1905. And this discovery and the reaction to this discovery and the popular understanding of this are crucial to being able to understand what happened and why the 20th century was probably the worst century in mankind's history. But think about it. More people were killed, more destruction of nations, more war, more genocide, more evil in the 20th century than any other century in mankind's history. So let's look at this, this particular set of discoveries. And it had to do, came out of this question of thermodynamics when people were looking at this question of what actually is heat. And it had to do with the investigation of the relationship of heat to what was thought of, which was a something that didn't seem to have anything to do with heat, which is light. And um, by the night, by the end, of, middle of the 19th century, it was pretty clear that there was a relationship. Ampere, first of all, discovered that there was a relationship between, or Ersted, and then later Ampere, between magnetism and electricity. That these were related to each other. That if you had a current flowing through a wire and you brought a compass to it, the current would attract the compass like a, like a magnet would. And that if you actually Ampere did these experiments where if you had two wires, they would attract each other and repel each other just like magnets did. So the, and that then uh, uh, Joseph Henry and discovered the principle of induction, that if you move a magnet around the wire or you move a wire around a magnet, you could induce a current or a vice versa magnetic field. So this relationship of electricity to magnetism, that these somehow were related, and Gauss and Ampere and so forth did a lot of work on this. That light was also, uh, this is something Riemann was working on. Later Maxwell made a mathematical formulations for it, but Maxwell did not do anything original. But uh, Riemann and his collaborators, Weber and Kohlrausch and others, began to realize that light was connected to electromagnetism. Now, the other thing that was, was recognized, which you can just see from experiment, is that there's a relationship between heat and electromagnetism. You know this because if you turn on the burner of your electric stove, it'll start to radiate heat, right? It won't look any different, but if you touch it, put your hand over it, it'll start to get warm. And as it begins to heat up, it'll start to um, glow. And for it'll glow red. And if you could heat it up more, which, you know, if you've ever seen, heated up, looked at a, at a, um, you know, uh, making of steel or something like that, when you heat it up hotter, it'll start to glow yellow. And if you've ever seen the arc welder, uh, where people are welding, you know, you go by a construction site and you see this arc welder, the light is, the metal can glow white. It's that hot. So there's a relationship between, there's two relationships. There's a relationship between heat and light, the color of the light, and there's a relationship between the heat and the intensity of the light. As the light tend to, tends to get go towards the higher colors, the, uh, the, the, from red to yellow to the higher uh, the other colors of the rainbow, it also gets brighter. Intensity is a more rigorous scientific term for brightness. Brightness is a vague term, but intensity is the is the measurable term. Okay. So the the subject of the investigation is what is the relationship between the material substance and light? 
and a whole bunch of experiments were done to show that this relationship was independent of the substance that was being heated, independent only on the temperature. That is, at a certain temperature, all substances will glow red. Doesn't matter whether it's iron or copper or nickel or anything, as long as it, it's capable of conducting heat, it will start to glow at that temperature. I mean, that color and its intensity of glowing at that color. Now, uh, so to, and, and these were the, and I'll describe this more in detail in a second, but this was the kind of discussion, these were the kind of investigations which Planck, Max Planck was, was looking at. Before discussing Planck's particular discovery, Tim's going to do a demonstration which is crucial to understanding that. And that is a demonstration of what is the nature, let's look at just first of all, what we, we asked the question, what is the nature of heat? The question is, what is the nature of light? How does light behave? Now, this was an old story, an old investigation, because Huygens, and it goes way back, what is, what do you, how does light behave? And um, Huygens had this theory that light was uh, propagated like water waves propagating through water. And uh, he hypothesized that there existed in the uh, space something which he called an ether which also later, because the question of light, if light is a wave propagating through something, then it has to propagate through something, like the water waves propagate through the water. When you drop a pebble in the water, the wave moves across the water, but the pebble just, you know, if you put a cork on the water, the, the water moves up and down. The pebble, I mean, the cork moves up and down. So the wave is transmitted through the water. So if light is a wave, what's it, what's it moving through? And Huygens used his theory that light was acting like a wave to explain certain properties of light, like polarization and also uh, refraction and various properties of light. Newton re, uh, rejected Huygens' idea and said that light must not be a wave because if it were a wave, it would be able to bend around objects, right? In other words, if you think of a water wave moving and you put an object in, in the middle of the water wave, the wave will move around the object, right? You've all seen that at the beach or so forth, right? The wave will, will flow and then if you're standing there, the, the wave will go around you, right? And but light, he says, you know, if you put, if you have a light and you put an object in front of the light, the the object stops the light, and therefore the light must not be a wave; it must be a stream of particles. He had, he, he called said that it was a stream of particles. Now, he didn't have any physical basis to say that, but in the 19th century there were two people, uh, uh, Augustine Fresnel in France and Thomas Young in England who did experiments to show that the behavior of light conformed to the hypothesis that light was a wave. Uh, so actually, you, Tim, you want to show the, sh show the experiment? Sure. He can do, he'll do one of these experiments here which will illustrate it for you. Yeah, so um, I just bought a little box here with uh, holes in it, and uh, I taped um, a human hair over one of the holes, and then I just took electrical tape and simply narrowed the opening around the hole so it was very, um, very short and, and extremely narrow. And so what I've created is, with the hair in the middle of it, I've created two double so uh, you can think of it as an opening with the column right in the center. 
And so draw a picture of it so that people yeah. So here's my hole with the human hair, and then I put electrical tape over it like that. So we're going to shoot light through this, and we'll see how light chooses to uh, to uh, respond. We'll we'll see if uh, light takes a new see what it does. Let's just see what it does. And uh, let's turn the light off here. Oh, oh that's extreme, man. Huh? <laughs> you gonna do it on the ceiling? Um, or on the wall? Uh, I was gonna point okay. it this direction. Okay. First, do the light. Just show the light on the. Oh. Did you say that Snell was looking at it temporarily? Snell, yes, yeah, Snell thought of it as a wave too. But just see, you see when the light hits the board. That's what it looks like when it's not being. It has no, nothing between it and the board. Okay, so the light goes from the laser to the board. What it does in between, we don't know. We see it come out of the laser and we see it hit the board. What it does in between, we don't know. Huh? What happens? You have to come closer. Oh, it's better up close. Oh, wow. Mm -hmm. You see, it makes. You see the lines, the, the, the fringe patterns? Oh, yeah. Oh, wow. huh. That's weird. So when he, when he shined it straight, the, it made, a, it made a, a, a circle which was everywhere illuminated. Mm. Right? When he made, when he puts it through here, you've got what? One, one, two, three, four, five, six, six little light and dark spaces, and the one in the middle is the most bright, and the other bright spaces are are less. Mm -hmm. You see that? And you notice that it's significantly wider. Yeah. Than it is vertical, even though the slots, the the openings through which I'm shining it, are. So why don't you go around and show people that how thi how thin the opening is so that people can actually see? It. Uh, see, I can't even see it myself. <laughs> <laughs> okay, yeah, what yeah, what you'll have to do is take the box and just hold it up to the light so you can see. It's it's gonna if I if I hand it to you like this, it's gonna be the lower. It's gonna be the lower. Right so, but the the. <laughs> so the pattern of the light that you saw is the pattern that you would imagine if you were seeing water wave in a, in a thin object in front of the water wave and the water wave would be coming up and then the thin object would break the water wave into two waves, right? And then the two waves would recombine behind the object, and when the waves recombined, when the, a wave has crests and troughs, right? So when, the, when a crest combined with a trough, they would cancel each other out. And, you, and, and then when the two crests would combine, they would get higher. And when two troughs combined, they would get extra low, right? So if, if if the light is behaving like a wave of crests and troughs, then and it meets a th it meets this barrier, this this human hair, and it goes around it, then it splits into two waves, and where the crests and the troughs combine, it cancels out and you see black. And where the crests combine, you see uh, extra bright, and where the where the crest doesn't combine with another crest, it's just the normal bright. So where you Would had. Would you like me to draw the pattern? Yeah, go ahead. 
So where you have the laser, also, do you have the laser with you? Yeah. Just once again, shine the laser, and you'll see the laser. When the laser was not shining through the ob through the through the uh, hair, you see that it's bright everywhere, right? The whole area is bright. So the hair is not a lens. The hair is just a human hair. It's just a physical object. But it interferes with the light the way a a board or a rock or something like that would interfere with a water wave. Right? So, um, if you just see, see the, 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 the gridded pattern here, if we just create our, our, our wall right here that we are shining it on, you see, see the, the places where you get the fringe, the fringes, right? So that experiment, we can't see the wave, the light wave, mm. but that experiment can only be explained by the assumption that the light is behaving like a wave. Mm. Yeah. You mean if you made the hole right. longer? Yeah. No, they would still be straight. They're always going to look straight. Because you're looking, yeah, the curvature, if you could look down on it like this, then you might see it like curvature like that, right? But it's like you're looking, it's imagine if the water, if, you're, if your eye is at, is at the level of the water, okay. okay? Then you would see the waves coming like this, right? If you were looking at a wave coming at you head on, it would it wouldn't you wouldn't see this part. You would just see a front coming at you, right? It would look like a like a straight line coming at you. Okay, so here's the question: What's the wave? What is the light propagating through? Whatever it's propagating through has to be so thin that it can pass through every material body because we don't feel it. When you walk in the water, you feel the water you're walking through, right? When you walk through air, you feel the air. If you run fast, you feel the air resistance, right? So whatever this thing is, this ether, has to be so thin that it can pass through every material body, but it has to be perfectly elastic. That is, it has to be so, uh, it can't be, it can't have holes in it. It has to be like a sheet of, rubber or something so that so that the, the, the light can, can propagate through it. Those holes it wouldn't make it through. It wouldn't make it through, it would dissipate. Right. So uh, okay. So that's that's one experiment. And you say light is a wave. And there's a whole lot of other experiments which were done which indicated that. There was another famous one which was done by a guy named uh, Poisson, who was trying to prove that, that, you, that Newton was right. And he said if, if light were a wave, then if you shined light at a sphere, then the shadow that it casts, the light would bend around the sphere, and you would have a shadow behind the sphere, and there would be a little bright spot of light in the center of that shadow. So Poisson said that can't be the case. So he designed an experiment to prove it wasn't going to happen. And he did the experiment, and lo and behold, there was a little white spot there. <laughs> so they now call that spot the Poisson spot. It's one of the only scientific experiments that's named for a guy who was trying to prove that it wouldn't exist. <laughs> so there's a whole bunch of experiments to the point where in the by the early 19th, by the end of the 19th century, it was pretty well established that light must be a wave, but there was still this paradox as to what is this ether that the wave is traveling through. And uh, Heinrich Hertz had done other experiments, and there were other experiments that had come out that showed that electricity also moved like waves, and that these waves were related to light waves and so forth. So 
Max Planck, this is the scene that Max Planck comes into. Now Planck was um, a very interesting guy. Uh, I don't know the exact date of his birth. It's uh, Shakespeare's birth, April 21st, 1858. 1858. Okay, so he was born two years before the start of the American Civil War in Kiel, Germany. And he came from a prominent family of theologians and so forth, and lawyers. His father was a lawyer. And they moved to Munich when he was a young man, and he enrolled at the University of Munich. And he wa was a uh, very, 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 very good, well-skilled uh, concert pianist. And his first choice of profession was to be a musician, to be a concert pianist. He particularly loved the music of Bach and Beethoven. And, uh, but he didn't think he was, he was really good, but he didn't think he'd be good enough to make it a career, so he, he enrolled in university. And his first uh, subject of study was to be a, uh, like Gauss and Riemann, <coughs> excuse me, was to be a philologist, which is somebody who studies languages but not just learns languages, but studies the principle of language, is how do you communicate an idea? Which is a similar question to the one we're looking at, because the idea exists in your head, and the, the, you want to recreate that idea in, in another person's mind, but you can't make that person have the idea. You communicate that idea somehow, either through words, but then it's not the sound of the words because two different languages can communicate the same idea using completely different sounds and completely different sentence structures and so on and so forth. So he was very interested in the idea of communication of ideas. And he got interested in physics and he went to his physics professor and he said, I'm thinking of making a career in physics. And his physics professor told him, this is not a good choice because first of all, there are no jobs for physics professors. And secondly, with the establishment of the second law of thermodynamics, everything that uh, needs to be discovered in physics has been discovered. <laughs> and the only thing left to do would just be to make some minor discoveries. <laughs> so Planck sort of pursued the idea anyway. And he got a, a secondary job in, in um, Berlin. And he decided to study this question of the relationship between heat and light, which is an, an expression of this relationship between the material and the immaterial. And at the time, they were working on a series of experiments that would try and get at this question by uh, looking, seeing if they could isolate all the other factors and just get at what is really going on in terms of the relationship between heat and light. So this was this this had to do with with, with what they called at the time black body radiation. And I was recently or not so recently but last fall in Berlin. The, the last year 2008 was a that was the 150th anniversary that's right of Planck's birth. So they had a exhibit at the Technical Museum in Berlin, which was a terrible exhibit. But, um, I mean, if you went through this exhibit, you'd know nothing about Planck, except the very beginning, which had a little bit of description of his life, and they had some interviews with him, which were interesting. But there was this one, uh, they, they had a, a, a uh, one of these black body apparatus that they were doing these experiments with. And as I said, what, what, what they were looking at was the relationship between the color and intensity of the light and the, um, the color and the intensity of the light and the heat and the temperature of the body. Now the other thing, the guy, Thomas Young, who did this experiment that Tim just showed us, he also experimented around and using the same kind of apparatus Tim did, if you, he was using a red laser. If you use a white light and you do very careful experiments, 
you can make the white light as you break it up into these in, by this, these hairs you'll see the fringe patterns will also have colors to them and he was able to make very very fine measurements and come to the conclusion that the different colors were the result of the wavelength and frequency were, were a function of the wavelength and the frequency of the light so that the red colors were the longer frequencies and the and as you move from red to, to violet, you got into the higher frequencies of light. And in, in a wave, the frequency is inverse to the wavelength. The higher the frequency, the shorter the wavelength. So Planck, uh, so that, that was sort of the, the generally accepted theory. So the, the scientific theory showed two things. First of all, that a material substance will emit all light as it's heated immaterial uh, uh, independent of the of the what it, the material is made up of which meant that you're looking at a phenomenon which is a universal phenomenon of all material it doesn't vary from substance whether it's iron or or some type of alloy or anything you just pick anything that heats well. And the second thing that a, a material substance will absorb light at the same rate that it emits it. And the therefore if you if you have a black, if you have a white object, it reflects all light. If you have a black object, it absorbs light. So if you can get a black object to emit light by heating it, then you can get that same black object to absorb the light. And so they made these apparatus to investigate this, which were called black bodies. What they called to, to get a, a body which would radiate light but also absorb the light back in. So they made these, these instruments which were different shapes. The one I saw was a cylindrical shape. And on the inside of the cylinder, this you couldn't see, was painted black. And then it was surrounded with some insulating material. So you could heat the cylinder up, but it would not radiate any of the heat. When you, when you turn on the burner, you're heating the burner up, but it's radiating all the heat out into the air. So if you insulate it, then it just radiates the heat into the inside of the cylinder. And you close both ends of the cylinder, right? So you have a, and it's painted on the inside, it's painted black, it's a black body. So that as you heat it up, then it starts to radiate light, it gets hot and it starts to glow but you can maintain it at a certain, once you get it to a certain temperature, then the light it's radiating will also be reabsorbed. So it will reach a state of equilibrium. But of course, if you have both ends sealed up, you don't know what it's doing in there, right? Mm -hmm. So what they did was they poked a little tiny hole on the end. And that let a little piece of the light out, which meant it was still doing a little bit like what the stove is doing. That is, some of the energy was go coming out of the body, right? But it was so small, so it wasn't perfect, but it was so small that you could, you, to maintain the temperature, once you got it to a certain, once you got it heated up to a certain temperature, it didn't take a lot of energy to keep it at that temperature because it was insulated. And then they took that light that came out of the hole and they ran it through a prism to look at the colors that it was of the light that it was radiating. And if you notice, like when you look at the stove, you'll see as you heat the stove up, the, uh, as you heat the stove up, the stove goes from red to yellow, if you heat the iron up, to the higher thing. And as it gets hotter, the color goes from the lower frequencies to the higher frequencies and the brightness increases right so it gets more intense 
But if you put it through a prism, if you were to take that light coming off the stove or this light coming out of the black body and you put it through a prism, you'll see that at every temperature, actually all the colors are being radiated. But, the, but some of the colors are more intense. For example, when, when you see the stove, when you turn on your stove and you, it starts to heat up and you start to feel the heat, it's radiating infrared. It's not bright. You can't see it, right? But you can feel it. But if you were to take it and that light and put it through a prism, you'd see it would also have some red, some yellow, some orange. But that would be very dim. So if you draw a curve, this curve is is the frequency and this is the intensity. This is frequency and this is intensity. Then you would see that the curve would look something like this. So that at for a given temperature so say this was 200 degrees. At 200 degrees, this frequency of light, which would probably be infrared, would be the most intense of the light that's being spread out. And the, the, lower, the higher frequencies would, would drop off. And if you then heat it up, you know, say to 500 degrees, it might look like this. So that the more intense frequency would be shifted a little bit further to the right, and here you would it would look like it was it would look like it was glowing red, but if you were to carefully analyze the light, it would also have some yellow and some infrared and some green and some blue and some violet in there, but they would be dimmer. So the the, the red would be the one you would see, and then if you heat it up more, it might look like that. And this would be, say, yellow, <coughs> right? So all the colors would be in there, but the yellow would be the brightest. Yeah. Actually, I have a perfect demonstration on my laser pointer. Okay. Because I can shoot um, just a generic blue light. Yeah. I can shoot a red light. Yeah. And I don't know if you guys can. It works maybe when you're closer up, but you have you obviously have the. the center focus of this thing, but then you have, here I can use my finger to disperse it, but um, you have a glow around it. But oh yeah, as soon different as colors, I, yeah. But the blue is sort of a more overwhelming right. uh, color, so if I disperse it like that, and then I shine the blue on it. Yeah, you get, oh, you get, yeah. You the, get, see, the red is still there. The red is still there. But the blue light just happens to be much brighter. Yeah. And the way that laser is doing that is it's, it has a, a substance which will glow at, at different temperatures with, with certain... I guess that's how they tell stars is different heat. That's, right? yeah, sure. Huh. And the black, the black body is sort of the opposite of a, of a it, which is one of the reasons why they were studying, it's sort of the opposite of a light bulb. As a light bulb, you want something which, as you heat it up, radiates heat radiates light but doesn't absorb it, right? And the black body, you want something which absorbs the light as you heat it up, okay? So this is what the experimental data showed. But this experimental data could not be explained because if light were a wave, imagine this, if light were a wave and it was heating up, then you would have this body heating up and oh, inside was a vacuum. There was no air in there, right? So, so the only thing in the cavity was the light. So if the, if, if the light were waves coming off the, coming off the, um, the, the, the material, then you would imagine that as you heated this thing up and it got to a state of equilibrium, it would function like a wave in a, um, like in a bathtub. If you, you know, start a wave going in the bathtub, it'll start with these big, long waves which are spread out. Then it'll hit the sides, and it'll bounce back, and the waves will get shorter and smaller, higher frequencies, until they tamp down, and you get these high frequency waves, right? So that would mean that at any given temperature, as you 
reached an equilibrium state where the light was being reflected and absorbing, that the curve would always go towards the ultraviolet. Right? That's one thing. The other thing that didn't that happen is that the if this were say 200 degrees and this was 500 degrees this might be a thousand degrees and you see that the rate at which you're moving towards the higher frequencies gets less and less as you increase the temperature so that to move the to move from red to orange might only take you 200 degrees, but to get the peak intensity from orange to yellow might take another 700 degrees. And the further you increase the temperature, the more it, the, the slower at which that peak shifted towards the higher frequencies. So the question was, how do you explain that this, if light is a wave, how do you explain the fact that it's not behaving like the ways we know? Now here we have one experiment, you saw, that can only be explained by assuming light's a wave. Here's another experiment which shows when you look at the relationship of the light to the material substance that it's not interacting like waves that we know. So different people had tried to come up with some mathematical equation to explain this. And they were just trying to look for some formula that would, assuming that light's a wave, that would relate this idea of the temperature and the entropy and the energy to the, um, to what, what was actually observed. Do now, they yeah. Question that yeah. Yeah, red, takes more, orange, right, yellow. for the peak. For the peak, yeah, these different things. Yeah. Um, so does that happen, like, dramatically between each one, where you get a huge uh, spike and or actually they get smaller, so... Um, no, it, what it, happens, it happens slowly. You know, you can, you, they did very careful experiments where they increased the temperature in very small increments and then took the measurements. Mm -hmm. So this happened very slowly. But once it happened, was it a huge, huge difference between one length and the other? No. Okay. It's very small. But what what Planck was what? Excuse me, I just got something going on. Okay, maybe it'll calm down. So what Planck, what Planck said is, well, the only thing that it can explain this, this phenomenon is to assume that what's happening in the material is that there are small, that the radiating light is being emitted by small harmonic oscillators, things which are moving back and forth. He didn't say what they were, but he said small things that are moving back and forth, and that they're moving back and forth at a particular frequency and the ones that are moving at the frequency of red emit red light, and the ones that are moving at the frequency of ultraviolet or ultraviolet lights, and the ones that are moving at the frequency of yellow or yellow and so on and so forth. So that this distribution of the intensities reflects the distribution of the proportionality of the rates at which whatever uh, number of oscillators in there are oscillating at are, are distributed by, right? So if it's red, if the peak is red, then most of them are oscillating here, and a smaller proportion are oscillating here, there's a smaller proportion oscillating there. So this, this curve is a curve which expresses the distribution of the frequencies at which the uh, small oscillators in the material are oscillating. Okay? So this measures 
the entropy of the system because this is an equilibrium and at this equilibrium this is the this is the most probable the reason why it it oscillates at this is that th this the material substance at that temperature has a huge number of oscillators in it but at that temperature the oscillators organize themselves to oscillate in this distribution and he said, we don't know what the cause of it is, but whatever the cause of it is, this is the most probable distribution of these things. Okay. But then the question is, what is the relationship between a continuous increase of temperature and the way in which these things change? So he did a bunch of calculations, and he said, the only way I can get the calculations to fit what we actually observe is to, abs is to assume two things. One is, or basically to assume one thing that's the most important, which is that the oscillators do not oscillate at every continuous possible frequency. They only oscillate at integral, into, you know, whole number ratios, whole number proportions of the frequency times a very small number, which he called H, which is now called Planck's constant. Okay, now what that means is, I'll give you a, a crude example, which is not really because he's his whole point was I don't know what these things are and I don't know what they're doing I'm just assuming they do this right but imagine if you had a, a pendulum swinging okay so you lift the pendulum up to to two feet and you drop it and it imagine there was no friction and the pendulum would swing up two feet and then swing back two feet and then up two feet and then back two feet right like that okay? now imagine if you and then you pick it up to two and a quarter feet and you let it go and it swings back and forth between two and a quarter feet, right? And then you pick it up to two and a half and it swings back and forth to two and a half, right? So if that's what the oscillators in there were doing, then as you increase the temperature continuously, they would increase their, their oscillations because the, the frequency of a pendulum going up two feet and a, is less than a pendulum or is greater than a pendulum going up two and a half feet. That's going to take a longer time. Right? So the, the, if it could go continuously, if that's what the pendulum were actually doing, if that's what the oscillators were doing, then as you had an increased constant, continuous increase in temperature, you would have a continuous increase in oscillations. And you wouldn't see this definite hump in there. You wouldn't see this dropping off. So he said, what's, what they're doing and I can't explain why, but I have to come to the conclusion, which is really one which is just completely surprising. But this is the beauty of it. It's like Kepler dis deter discovering that the equant doesn't exist. He starts out to find the equant, and he, comes, he ends up proving it doesn't exist. But he has the courage to say, I know that this mistake, this difference I have, is because this thing doesn't exist. So Planck said what, what's happening is that the way these things are oscillating is if Imagine you had, and this is not his analogy, this is mine, okay. He, maybe he used this, I don't know. But imagine if you had a, a um, pendulum that was swinging at two feet, and you picked it up this time to two and a quarter feet, and it still only swung at two feet. And then you picked it up to two and a half feet, and it still only swung back and forth at two feet. And then you picked it up to two and three quarters feet, and it still only swung back two feet. And then you picked it up to two and eight ninths, and it still only swung at two feet. And then you got it up to three feet, and it started swinging at three feet. And then you picked it up to three and a quarter, and it still only swung at three feet. And then three and a half, and it still only swung at three. And until you got to four, then it would start swinging at four feet. So these oscillators can only act, only they, they move back and forth continuously, but only in certain quantized states. It's like Kepler's planetary orbits. That the planets can move around, they can oscillate around the sun, 
but not at any frequency, only at those frequencies which are harmonic, consistent with the harmonics that human beings use to communicate musical ideas. So that's what Planck said is happening in the material. Okay? But that the wave that was happening, the radiation inside the cavity, was still continuous. So the material was these quantized oscillators, but they were oscillating still a, a continuous wave. Now this freaked everybody out. Nobody accepted this, except they couldn't deny that, that Planck's assumption worked. And it threw science into a complete uproar. Then in 1905, a unknown uh, guy in working in the Swiss patent office named Albert Einstein uh, had published a, pa published a, a paper. This was 1905, and this was Einstein's, they call it Einstein's miracle year because he published five papers in it. Mm -hmm. And the first paper he published was a paper on Brownian motion which was a, a paper about this, this English botanist, Brown, had studied pollen in a, in a uh, water. And if you look at pollen in the water, the pollen, you look at it under a microscope, the pollen moves around, right? And so no one could explain why the pollen was moving around, sort of arbitrarily just wiggling around. Why, it looked still, but the water it was jiggling around, right? So some people tried to explain this. They couldn't figure out how to explain it. And Einstein showed that, because if you said, well, the water molecules are moving around, but the pollen is a, something you can see with a microscope. The molecules were, you know, billions of times smaller. So how could something billions of times smaller move something that big? So Einstein showed that actually they could, that, if, that one of them couldn't, but the action of millions of them actually could. And, then, and that was sort of an interesting paper, and, and he all, the other paper he wrote that year was another one which used a study of sugar dissolving in water to estimate the size, what the actual size of the sugar molecules were. It's the first time anybody had done that. But in between those two papers, he published another paper, which is the one he won the Nobel Prize for, which was not the theory of special relativity. That he published at, at later, in the same year, but later in the year. But this paper was called A Heuristic Investigation of the Propagation of Light. Now, he used the term heuristic. Heuristic is, means basically a pedagogical demonstration. It's a, it's a theory you make in order to, which you don't say is the real one, but the one that will get you to the real one. And in this, Einstein extended Planck's method and showed that this experimental evidence, you could get to the solution Planck got to by not even assuming anything was going on inside the metal or inside the body, but that the that the, the uh, uh, distribution of the light, of the frequencies of the light, was caused by the fact that the light was actually made up of small quanta that were wiggling back and forth, oscillating at these frequencies. And he called them light quanta, which later became named photons. Now, just to, you, people throw around this term all the time now. Say Einstein discovered the quantum of light, the quant, light quanta, which we now call photons, proving Newton was correct, and blah, 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 right? It's all bullshit. It's not what Einstein said. In fact, one of Einstein's, the guy who got him the job at the patent office was a guy named Michel Besso, who was a good friend, physicist who helped him do this work. And Besso became his friend through his whole life. So Einstein wrote this in 1905, he was 24 years old. 
when he died, two years, uh, uh, months, few, several months before he died in 1955, he wrote a letter to Besso saying, after all this time, I still don't know what light quanta are. <laughs> so the idea that people walk, throw around this term as if they know what they're talking about is all bullshit. Because Einstein was saying, I'm, what, where people say he put a period, he put a question mark. Okay? But he, there was another phenomenon. It wasn't just this theoretic. He said, well, but, so I can get to Planck's result by assuming not that the material is quantized, is acting in a quantized way, but saying that the light is quantized. Well, this is a paradox because we just saw that light acts like a wave. If light were a quantized, if it were a beam of particles, it wouldn't produce that result that Tim just demonstrated to us. There's no way. If you, if you had, imagine if you had a, a, a gun shooting ping pong balls, okay, at, at a hole with a, with a, with a, thing in it, right? And the balls, you know, were going through that, and they were hitting the screen. Then the balls would hit the ones that went through the right slit would all line up here, and the ones that went through the left slit would all line up line up there, and the ones that hit the 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 hair would bounce off, right? You wouldn't see those inner fringes that we saw of different intensities. You'd see two lines. But there were other experiments that, that were, that were um, coming about at the time. Uh, um, that showed that when you shined light on conducting metals, metals that conduct electricity, that you could produce an electric current coming off the metals. And that was an interesting piece of experiment, which could not be explained. But what was the most perplexing thing that, that couldn't be explained about it was that if you increase the intensity of the light that's hitting the conducting material, it didn't, uh, it didn't increase the power that the current had coming off. In other words, you, you have a, a piece of metal. We're looking at it sideways. Here's your metal. And you shine the light on it here, okay? And a electric current comes off this way. And if you put a positive charge here, that, that accelerates the current coming towards it, right? And if you put a negative charge here, that will tend to repel the electrons, right? So by increasing the power of this negative charge here, slowly, you can figure out what power, at what power the electrons stop coming off here, right? And that will tell you what the power that they're coming off if you have no charge. Okay, so you can measure the intensity that they're coming off. But if you, if you shine red light on this, you get a certain power. And if you increase the intensity of the red light, the power at which the electrons comes off doesn't change. You get more of them, but it doesn't change the power. But if you change the frequency of the light, then the power changes. In the color? The color, yeah. You change the red from you change red it to light red. Or, or to orange, or to green, or to blue. You'll, the power changes. So the intensity only changes the number. The, to get the power change, the, the, the energy with which they come off to increase, you have to change the color. And Einstein, nobody could explain this. But okay, Einstein. What do you mean by number? You just said that well, the you, you, intensity doesn't change. Right, but it, well, electricity you can measure that by the you know you can measure the the number by the by the amperage of the of the because they use an analogy of of uh, if you think of electricity as water, say water flowing through a pipe, 
okay? So you can measure the amount of water that's coming out of the pipe or the pressure that is coming out, right? So when I say the number, I mean like the amount of the water that would be coming out of the pipe as opposed to the force with which it's coming out. Okay? Mm. And the thing that changes the force, the power that is coming out, is the color. The intensity only changes how much comes out. Mm. And so Einstein said, well, nobody could explain how that could be, because if light were a wave, then as you increase the intensity, like if you're standing on the beach, right, and a wave comes at you, then um, uh, the wave has a certain force to you, force, right? Or like, like if you're, if you're standing on a beach and you go further out and the waves hit you, they hit you with a lot of force, right? As you move further away from the wave, the, in, the intensity of the wave gets less and less, right? So if you move this, if you move this light, the source of the light closer and closer to the, to the uh, metal, you would expect it would be hitting with more force, right? And therefore the power of the electricity coming off would be greater, but it doesn't change. And if you move it further away, you would think the, the amount that came out, but it doesn't change. So what Einstein says is this can't be explained by light as a wave. Even though he says in this paper, he says, the wave theory of light is so well-founded that we'll, it, it will never be replaced. But this phenomena doesn't get explained by a wave. Mm. This phenomena only gets explained by, if, if you consider light to be quantized as he had just discussed, shown based on the black body radiation. So this paper threw everybody up in arms. <laughs> but then he threw people up in further arms with his, with his, with his later paper that, uh, a few months later, on the theory of special relativity, which I'm not gonna talk about tonight. We can talk about that tomorrow. Yeah. And, then, and then he finished the paper, he finished the year in December with a very short paper called The Electrodynamics of Moving Bodies in which he made his, it's about three pages. And he, two and a half pages, and he made his famous statement of E equals MC squared. We'll talk about that later too. But, so here you have a paradox, right? You have on the one hand, experimental evidence which shows that light is a continuous function, acts like a wave. But we have a problem because we don't know it's a wave, but what is it propagating through? And I should just say that this is relative to both this and something else, which is that there was another experiment done by Mike, the Michelson-Morley experiment, which were done in Cleveland and later out in California, where they tried to measure, find this ether. And the idea was that if light were, if there were an ether, then the light would be moving faster if it was moving, if you were moving, if the earth were moving through the ether in this direction, then light shining in the direction of the earth would be pushed, would, would move at a different speed because it would be pushing against the ether, then light that was moving crossways to the ether. Just like if you're, if you're standing on a river and you're moving with the current, you're gonna move faster than if you're moving across the current. So they did an experiment, they took a, a beam of light and they shined it at a mirror, a half slivered mirror so that they put a mirror here and they put a, so part of it went through, part of it was reflected back, they put a mirror there, they put another mirror here so that it was reflected back and then reflected down here so that this light went in the direction of the ether and this light went against it. And they looked for interference patterns here like the ones that we saw that Kim showed us. And they didn't find any. So that tended to prove what everybody suspected was that this substance, which nobody could figure out how it could exist, didn't exist. So now you've got a problem that the light is moving through the media, through the, through the, it acts like a wave, but we don't know what it's moving through. 
And then we have evidence which shows that it's acting like a stream of particles, but we don't know what it's a particle of. So you have contradictory experimental evidence. You can't deny the universe is behaving that way. Uh, okay, so these, this is what Einstein and Planck are saying. That what happens then, and this is, this is, this is really the, the crucial point. What happens then, look at what's happening in the world right now, okay? This is 1900, 1905. You have the success of Lincoln's victory over the Confederates. You have the establishment of, a, uh, the, of the consolidation of the American system as an economic power. You then have the spread of the American system, the attempt to spread the American system to continental, to Eurasia, and the beginning of the development of continental powers, North American continental powers, South American continental powers, Eurasian continental powers. You have this, in Europe it's spreading very <coughs> fast, and the British Empire and the oligarchy knows that they have to somehow prevent the development of these continental powers. And the uh, this is occurring at a time when the offensive against the idea that we were discussing earlier about Leibniz and Riemann and Kepler and so forth, that it was the power of the human mind to discover these kinds of revolutionary ideas which showed the self-perfectibility of man. Instead, the, the oligarchy began pushing the idea that, that the universe was not something which moved from lower states of order to higher states of order, but which was a universe in which the characteristic of action was fundamentally disorder. That the human mind was fundamentally irrational. And rationality was an aberration against irrationality. You saw this in the culture of Germany. Look at the attack that Linz talked about against Beethoven and Bach by Liszt and Brahm, I mean Liszt and, and Wagner against Brahms this idea that, that, that the, that, and the rise of existential philosophy of Nietzsche, of Schopenhauer, uh, that, that it was the fundamental irrational, that man was fundamentally irrational, that the world was ultimately crazy. These were the kinds of cultural philosophies which were being pumped in to counter the demonstration that it was the creative powers of the human mind around which society should be organized. And this was being countered by the British Empire, which was trying to push the idea that no, the universe is, as Aristotle said, totally irrational. And if there's change in the world, the only kind of change that can occur is irrational change. You have a choice between irrational, ch if you want change, it's gotta be irrational. If you want order, it's got to be strictly determined. So the, the universe is either uh, irrational, entropic, disordered, or it's totally determined. But here you have experimental evidence which shows that it can't be, it can't be precisely determined. Some experimental evidence looks like a wave. Some experimental evidence says light's a particle. You can't, you can't, you, you don't have a way to deter, to come up with a idea which can show that the universe can determine, be determined by both things. So into this comes a whole movement, and this is, this starts in 1905. So what's going on at that point is by night, by, by the turn of the century, McKinley is assassinated. You have the whole build-up to World War I, which is going on during this period, beginning with the dumping of Bismarck in 1890. And so actually the behavior of societies is conforming 
to this irrationalist philosophy, which the uh, which is which which uh, the British and the oligarchy are saying is the nature of man. In other words, you're seeing irrationality dominate society, and the physicists come. Certain physicists come along, especially. Um, Niels Bohr out of the out of Copenhagen was educated in Britain and others who say well we're going to solve this problem of the paradox and I'm being really summary here because this is not the only scientific evidence there's a whole lot of stuff involved here I'm just trying to be pedagogical by picking this one thing and saying that the way we can solve this the way you solve this problem that Einstein and Planck have presented to us and a whole lot of other experimental evidence, is by realizing that the universe is as irrational as society. That the irrationality we're seeing in society is the irrationality, is the way the universe works. The way we solve this problem of light being a wave and a particle is we solve it by saying is that it's undetermined. Now, this is one step lower than Ptolemy, right? Because Ptolemy and Aristotle said, well, the planets are moving about the sun, I mean, uh, around the earth and blah, blah, blah. That's what we say they're doing. But we really don't know. Okay? God knows, but we don't know. Right? Man can never know, but God certainly does. What, what, Bohr and the Copenhagen interpretation of quantum effects decides is the way you solve this problem is by saying that the universe doesn't know. That is, it's not that, it's not that we don't know. We have some experiments that say light is a wave. We have some experiments that show light is a particle. Einstein and Planck have showed us how, how this works. So how do we explain that? Well, Bohr says the way we explain that is we say that the light behaves like a wave when our experiments show it's a wave. That's when it becomes a wave. When our experiments show it's a particle, that's when it becomes a particle. When we're not looking at it, it's neither. Well, what is it? Don't try and make sense of it. Now, but, they, but, but then they go one step further. They say, they don't say, don't try and make sense of it because it's beyond human comprehension. They say, no, this is human comprehension of the universe. We have finally comprehended nature and its greatest secrets. Huh. Nature is, the comprehension of nature is that it is irrational. Whoa. That it is as crazy as we are. <laughs> <laughs> now, a lot of physicists, a lot of people bought this, caved into this, because th this is not a, as I say, there's a whole lot more to, these, to this science and that, that sort of builds up this thing. Maybe tomorrow we can get into a lot more details about it. But what, what, uh, what, what happened, you know, the, the point is that based on that, based on saying that that's the way the universe works, the trend in physics was to then develop a mathematics based on using purely statistical methods, purely probability theory and statistical methods that was very accurate in describing the experimental observation. That is explaining the appearance of light as a wave and light as a particle as the consequence of simply probability. But that, and showing that, and as the modern interpretation of quantum mechanics says, we can use the mathematics of assuming light is a wave and the mathematics of assuming light is a particle and come up with the same probability. And therefore, the probability, statistical mechanics, is not just our mathematics, but it is what the world is really doing. And this led to a huge argument 
because Einstein and Planck said, look, we put a big question mark here. We created a revolution. We said you can't look at the universe simply by a simple methods. That there's something very dramatic going on here. And that's what science has to discover. But the 